Yeah, mine yeah, is saying- It gave me an alert that said, you, you know, this meeting is being recorded. Okay, I certainly hope that it actually works. <laughs> okay. And if so, not, we'll do it again. Yeah. That's the beauty well, of digital, right? All right, so everybody, welcome to Arthritis Awareness Month. I'm here joined by Karina Wu. Um, so what we're gonna to do today is we're going to explain what is arthritis. We're going to drop some statistics on arthritis to help educate everybody. And then we're gonna chat about some of the different options that we can do to try to help people become more active or stay active. And hopefully along the way, we will dispel some myths and talk some science. Okay, so just a quick introduction. I'm Dr. Edmund Kleeman, orthopedic surgeon here in New York, and I am accompanied by Karina Wu, who is uh, an amazing physical therapist also here in New York City that we've had the opportunity to work with closely over the past few years. If you guys get value out of this video, then please go ahead and subscribe and click the like link below. What is arthritis? So just briefly, and I'm gonna just try to break it down into its most simple form, in our joints, the end is coated with a very smooth coating called hyaline cartilage. And if that starts to wear down, that's called arthritis. And sometimes if it wears down a lot, there may be nothing covering the bone. Sometimes those bones will rub on each other. It can even make that sort of crackling sound that's sort of uncomfortable to hear. And then along the process, the joint gets irritated, the joint lining called the synovium, and it can get really inflamed. And as part of that, it can get swollen, it can get stiff, and these things will cause pain and reduce uh, functionality. I, do, you, do you have anything to add? That's pretty much what you see as well, correct? Correct. I, when I'm explaining arthritis to a patient, I literally simplify it and I say it's inflammation or irritation in the joint. So in between the two bones. Sorry, I'm having a cat issue right now. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so, to, so to simplify it, I just say it's your joint is where the two bones come together. And arthritis means that there's some sort of irritation or inflammation in between the two bones. Yeah, and, and again, and I try to hone down because some people sometimes ask me, can I, as a surgeon, remove the arthritis? And I explain to them that arthritis is that they're missing the cartilage. So it's not really an issue of giving, you know, of removing something, it's that they're missing something, uh, and that's the issue. So a, a key point there too. Okay, so some statistics. So I think what we could do is maybe go back and forth with some yeah. statistics. I'll pull up one here. Uh, there are more than 350 million people in the world that have some form of arthritis. Now, that's sort of a bucket for lots of different kinds. That's osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, gout, you know, all those different kinds. But about 350 million people in the world. And in America, it appears that about one out of four people have one of these forms of arthritis. So that's a lot. So that's 25% of the country has some form of arthritis. And... As for the CDC, they believe that by 2040, it'll be 80 million Americans that have some form of arthritis. So that's a lot. That's a lot of people. Um, what about you? Do you have any statistics? Yep. So, so our arthritis statistics are, it is the leading cause of disability. It has impacted us in the workplace. There, statistically, it will show 172 million work days lost per year, and that costs our economy billions of dollars. Yeah, so I'll jump in. So on that cost, so there were some also interesting statistics. So what is the cost? So based in 2013, there was some estimate that there's about a $300 billion bill for America for the cost of arthritis. And they say that about 140 billion is from direct medical cost and about 160 billion due to lost wages from people having these issues, not being able to work. Um, and, you know, so that's a big number that affects this uh, economy every year. So it's pretty staggering. Yeah, and if you look to at the number of people with arthritis, so 92% of people who have arthritis are limited by daily pain. That's why they are seeking you know, things to help manage or try to clear up this pain that they're feeling. And you'll find that one in four are on a healthcare plan. So they are able to use healthcare to help, but they it's costing our economy billions for this really expensive healthcare. Absolutely. So 
I'm gonna drill down just a little bit, just because I think the kind of arthritis that you and I see mostly of is called osteoarthritis. Some statistics, again, from about 2020 is about 32 million people in this country have osteoarthritis. And they say about 60% are women. So more women than men are yeah. getting arthritis. And then uh, with regard to, and I see a lot of this is knee arthritis, and it could be based on my specialty, about they say 14 million Americans have really painful knee arthritis, um, you know, just honing it down, painful osteoarthritis, maybe the most common form that we see. As we get older, the likelihood of getting arthritis increases. So people in that age range between 18 and 40, only about like 7%. Then as we go from 45 to 65, about 30% and above 65, almost 50% of people are gonna have some arthritis. And, and it's interesting, in that oldest category, the one that maybe we worry about a lot, actually for those who have arthritis, they're about two and a half times more likely to fall if they have arthritis than someone in the age group that doesn't. So it's a lot, so a lot of statistics, but I think the, the take home is that it, it is a big problem. It's something that we all deal with. We know everybody knows somebody who has arthritis and it's something we need to uh, deal with. And they say the average age is 48, which is when you're going to be getting that first diagnosis. Me personally, I was diagnosed with arthritis at the ripe old age of 35. But as a female, I was twice as likely to be affected by this condition. All right. So Karina, just uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about your practice here in Manhattan. Sort of what do you do? What do you specialize in? Sure. So I am a physical therapist. I am the owner and clinical director of Active Care Physical Therapy. We're located on 37th between 5th and 6th. I have been in practice for 22 years now. We're getting up there in numbers. Yeah. And uh, my practice specializes in manual therapies, Pilates-based rehabilitation, and other sort of modalities that can help with pain. So those are things like kinesiology tape, the instrument-assisted soft tissue mobilization, and now, newly, blood flow restriction training, which is a tremendous, which is of tremendous benefit for those with osteoarthritis, provided you don't have any cardiovascular issues. So what is that? I, I, that's something new. Tell me about that a little bit. So blood flow restriction training has been around since the 60s and 70s in performance and bodybuilding. If you think right. back, like you'd see these huge bodybuilders strapping themselves up and then pumping iron and they would just grow. So the basic premise is it is controlled limb occlusion at a very low limb occlusion pressure, you're not fully occluding and cutting off your blood supply. Okay. So when you do that, you so are- you actually strap something on your patient around their leg or yes. something like that? Okay. Yes. So typically it's like a cuff or something with an inflatable bladder, but okay. basically you're going to occlude the limb and there's only four spots. It's by the upper arms or by the upper thighs. Okay. And because the arterial walls are stiffer, you're not gonna cut off the arterial blood supply, which has the oxygen going into the limb. You cut off the venous blood supply coming back out, which has no oxygen. So. The premise is, as you do that, you're going to deplete the area of oxygenated blood and that you're going to work out at a low enough resistance where you're going to use up the oxygen that's in there. What that does is it creates a stressful environment such that your body recruits more motor units or muscle fibers and it stimulates the hypertrophic signaling cascade. So you have release of growth hormone from the pituitary gland and insulin-like growth factor from the liver. And both of those are great for muscle healing, bone healing, and bone growth. So it's huge and not, I don't feel like people are maybe using it as much because it pretty much is applicable on everyone. Obviously performance in sports, but now distinctly with arthritis, again, provided you don't have cardiovascular issues because it's a low intensity workout but it's actually an incredibly high intensity workout. Yeah. Just it's because of the cellular stresses, right? The system stresses, but you don't have to lift heavy weights. So it's perfect for elderly who cannot lift heavy weights, but they still need enough mechanical stress. It's awesome. Yeah. 
That's really interesting. I mean, that's something new that I haven't really heard much about. I also assume, based on, also on the things that you said, by placing it under a higher stress environment, it might make the system forced to learn how to be more efficient as well, um, maybe to extract more oxygen and just run more efficiently. That's really interesting. Um, yeah. That's something new. So that's, there's, that's, there's, there's two that's, analogies. Uh, there's one like, it's like training in Denver or up at altitude, which has less oxygen, right? So yeah. it forces your system to become more efficient yeah. so that when you're back down here at land level, you know, like what a normal land level would right. be, your system is just like so much more smoothly operating. Or as another client said, it's like starvation right. because it is a stressor to your system. But the right. benefit is it makes you recruit more muscle fibers faster yeah. and grow more muscle. So you get faster strength and hypertrophy in the muscle tissue, which again, it could be applicable to everyone. Because if you just do a squat set, some straight leg raises, some knee extension, you do those three exercises with the blood flow restriction training, you're going to increase your strength and hypertrophy faster. How long are, are you using it in, in your PTs, So PTs are a little late to the game, uh, but it's been used for the last few years. Um, all right. So that's really cool. I'm going to change it. So when I was doing a little bit of research for this conversation with you, I actually was looking you up and I was looking through some of the videos that you've done in the past. And I found that you were on Dr. Oz's show a couple of times. So that's pretty cool. How was that? I, I, was that like fun? Was that interesting? Stressful? That seemed pretty cool. It was fun. It was definitely interesting. It was a great chance to promote our profession and share with the world, you know, a lot of great health benefits from a physical therapist perspective. It was stressful because it is live and it is on right. national TV. But, you know, at the end of the day, I'm always promoting our industry so that we can get better quality care out there. So I'm going to transition. A lot of the questions that I get from patients, and I'm sure you similarly get them, you know, why did I get arthritis? Complicated question, because it's probably multifactorial, particularly talking about the osteoarthritis. And so I think it breaks down into a couple of things. Like many medical things, there's probably some genetic component that predisposes people. You know, certainly like you said, you had it at a younger age. There must be some genetic predisposition. Then the next thing that I explain to patients is that some previous trauma to the joint is also a catalyst. So if someone tears their meniscus uh, or someone da dings some of their cartilage or blows out an ACL, there is a very high likelihood that some 10 years, 20 years later that they're going to start getting arthritis. So those are kind of like the easy answers to patients. And then where things get a little bit tricky is people will very often will tell me, well, I've been playing hockey or tennis my whole life, or I go running my whole life. Did that cause my arthritis? And so there, I think we have to be a little bit more careful. And because the science is not very, let's say, consistent to say either yes or no. And that brings me to the next point is, you know, really, what is our goal with patients who have arthritis? And for really, basically everybody, is we want everybody to live sort of a physically active life, right? And, and the reason is that it reduces mortality, cardiovascular disease, dementia, diabetes, you know, like so many things it's important for in our life. Careful with patients because we want to promote them to be physically active and not be afraid that being physically active causes these issues. And there's really no science to support that belief, although it's a strong one, and many patients are convinced that they developed arthritis because they ran for many years, that's just not what the science says. Myself as an example, every time I get injured, I call it market research, but I was doing a leg press and I felt a twang in my hip and I kind of paused and then I tried another repetition of the leg press and it was kind of okay. And then I'm like, okay, let me just finish my set and then as opposed to like maybe stopping and like maybe ceasing activities on the lower legs because of that weird pain and motion during that movement, I still continued and didn't bother with it probably because I was younger and you, you don't notice those things as much. And then later, the first joint I was diagnosed in arthritis with was my hip. Mm. 
So again, that's why I said that physical therapists and all, again, all healthcare providers have to really listen to someone's history and also maybe sort of provoke that admittance of other situations that someone might have forgotten. And right. that could have been the thing that started it. Right. Because that could have been, that episode could have been an initial small tear of your labrum, yes. the cartilage in the hip which over the course of years then developed. And that, that brings us back to why some people get arthritis is you could have had a small micro trauma that over the years led that. What if someone already has arthritis, can they be physically active, right? So we just talked about people, you know, are worried about if they're physically active, will they get arthritis? Like the young guy you were talking about. And then the next question, if you already have arthritis, and I'm sure you get the same question, you know, am I allowed to be physically active? Is it going to make my arthritis worse? Get some studies, and I can post these later to this, to this video. So the first one was a study that was published back in 2017. And this study is what they call a meta-analysis. So for people watching the video, what that means is that they comb through all the different studies. They find the ones that meet the criteria. And so here they found 15 studies and then they take all the data and they put it together. And what they were looking at is, does physical activity lead to arthritis? And what they actually found was inconclusive. Some studies said no, some studies said maybe. But what was really interesting is that what they did find in their meta-analysis is that for those patients who did have arthritis being physically active, reduce their risk by 50% for getting knee replacement surgery. So that, that's pretty significant. And then if you comb through this study just a little bit more, and this is where it gets a little bit interesting, but there's a little bit of like theory or hypothesis, if you will, is that it may be like a U-shaped curve, meaning that if you do some physical activity, it helps reduce, reduce your risk of arthritis and problems. But if you do too much, potentially, maybe if you're like a super high endurance person who's running a, I don't know, I'll make some crazy number up, like 200 miles a week or something like that, that maybe that's too much. And, and so that actually speaks to the next interesting point, right, is that medicine is precision, right? It needs to be tailored. Every human is slightly different. And, and so I always marvel that I might be going from room to patient room to patient room, and they may all have the diagnosis of knee arthritis, but, but their presentations are all different, how it affects their lives are all different, and how we address and treat them is different, which brings me to the next study I wanted to bring up. These patients have self-selected that they run, that they're runners. And so this is a large study. This is 1,200 people that they included in this study. And what was fascinating is that this specific group of people who have arthritis, but self-select that they are runners, okay, that running actually improves their knee pain. It doesn't make it worse. And not only that, there were no negative effects on their x-rays. So when they followed these people out over the course of 48 months, so four years, their x-rays did not get worse. Uh, and so that's really interesting. So that so that it's not cookie cutter. So if some patients have arthritis and they feel that they can run, then that's great. And the studies support them. They don't have to worry that, oh my God, I need to stop running because it's going to make my arthritis worse. That's not what the science supports. It supports that if you can run and you feel comfortable, then for you, that's good. But Absolutely. For, but for the other patients that say you and I see that can't run, okay, well, we don't want to force them to run. Because that's not, for their body, that's not the solution. We might need to find something different. Maybe it's cycling. Maybe it's swimming. Something lower impact that their body could handle. And so, so medicine requires a really close connection with the physical therapist and the patient, the doctor and the patient. It's different for each person. So I have a 64-year-old guy with arthritis and probably some meniscal involvement, but he is an ex-dancer. When I started him on the beginner exercises of isometrics and just anti-gravity isotonics, his body responded like that. I mean, and his pain went down significantly and rapidly. Swelling went down and he just felt much more functional. So whenever someone's always like, 
you know, can I, can I get back to running and this and that? It's what your body is going to tell me and I'm going to be the messenger. Physical therapy, sometimes people don't realize it's not a smooth uptrend of getting better where there's never any, you know, exacerbations, but we have gains and then there's a little regression, which is very common. You just try to minimize the regressions and you minimize the intensity of the regression so that you're consistently taking baby steps forward so that we can get you to discharge and get you back to your quality of life in whatever capacity that was at. Awesome. So, so you already are touching on the next thing I want to talk about is like, how do we treat these patients? So, so you're touched already on some physical therapy. We're going to revisit that in a second, but I'll go from the orthopedic side, limited armamentarium here to fight it. And so the non-surgical things that we do for some of these patients, let's say they're having a severe inflammatory response, sometimes like a cortisone shot to temporarily reduce that inflammation, make them more comfortable so that they can then maybe work with you. Know, you. Sometimes we try these things called hyaluronic acid injections, which are like lubricant injections. I like to call it WD-40 for the joint. Um, sometimes there's bracing for certain ac activities, physical therapy. So the other thing that I think is important is also just physical activity and exercise. So, so people don't realize, but that's actually part of the treatment plan is being physically active actually has been shown in studies to help improve physical function in patients who have arthritis. That kind of brings me to the next thing, which is your department, which is physical therapy. And it was interesting because I, I started, I pulled a couple of studies and one study I pulled was actually from Canada. And I thought this was really interesting. So they, they looked at patients who have, let's say arthritis, but aren't scheduled for knee replacement or didn't have knee replacement. And it was interesting that when they looked at the percentage, only about 20% of patients with arthritis ended up being referred to physical therapy. And I thought that was particularly low. You know, and I feel like I feel like there's an opportunity to really help these people, you know, get back on track. So that was one study, and I'd love to get to comment on that in one second. But the second study, and this was an interesting study about 80 patients who who they randomized, half of them got physical therapy, okay, and their physical therapy was manual therapy, which I'm going to love for you to just explain to people what that is, as well as the actual exercises you know, for the strength exercises versus patients who did not get any physical therapy. And so they showed, and they used different metrics. One of them was how far can you walk in six minutes? And so they found that those people who did physical therapy increased that distance by 13% compared to the ones who didn't. And their scores where they do these special surveys to see their functional scores, pain scores, improved by over 50% you know, in the group that did physical therapy. So I think, I think the science is pretty strong that, that physical therapy makes a difference. So I'd love for you to kind of explain to people, so what do you guys do in physical therapy, this manual therapy, the exercises, that's making these gains for them? Physical therapy is appropriate for everybody. If they're coming to us in a painful and inflammatory state, then our number one goal is to reduce the pain and the inflammation maintain muscle strength, maintain range of motion, and the biggest one is education. There's so much psychological involvement when you become a patient. So a lot of it is allaying the fears of, oh my gosh, am I gonna be sidelined? Um, will I ever get back to my sport? So beginner's exercises, we start with isometrics. If it hurts too much to move a joint, then we don't move the joint and we just wake the muscles up. Then when it's ready, we start with isotonic exercises where you're actually moving. You start with limb weight, and then you start with progressive exercises, PREs. So you start adding weight incrementally. Higher intensity or higher load exercises, nothing replaces high load resistance training if you really wanna develop a lot of muscle strength. Physical therapists give a lot of home exercise program. After that, you're gonna go into sports, type of agility exercises or sports specific exercises. So if you are someone who participates, then your physical therapist will go through the motions of what that particular sport requires. If it's side to side movement, quick stop and start. So there's a lot of things that we will help on the progression with. When we do manual therapy, and I have a great example about that, 
use our hands to loosen up soft tissues, which are the muscles, the tendons, and the ligaments a little bit. Sometimes we'll use instruments like Graston Technique as an instrument-assisted soft tissue mobilization. My, my example just recently was a 64-year-old guy with arthritis. He was always super frightened of me straightening his knee. So he got some arthritis, the knee goes into that resting position, which is about 20 degrees of flexion, right? And yep. it gets stuck slightly bent. So I was get some extension and then it released a little bit. And then he, he had the, oh, wow, I feel I can, I can straighten it while I'm standing and I'm not like forcing it, but I also feel the motion. So he, he was embracing it better, where it's like, oh, my joint can straighten again. Yeah, so it's things like that that are super cool to do, obviously, to change someone's life like well, that. Fantastic. All right. Well, that was amazing. So I, I think the next thing is, is I know that you're very involved with the arthritis walk and the awareness. Yay. So maybe let everybody know sort of what you're up to and how they can help. Okay, so this year I was asked to be the corporate chair again. I'm super honored. Um, so I've been helping to spread the word about raising funds, of course. And then again, just about arthritis. Our New York City walk is called the Walk to Cure Arthritis. And it is this, set, not this Saturday, it's Saturday, May 21st. It's down in Foley Square, which is down towards Chinatown. Active Care Physical Therapy has our own team and our booth. It's about a thousand people or so that come to walk and just help spread the word. And it's just a fun day. It's community give back and it's participating in something that's very close to my heart since I have arthritis, but also because we treat so many patients with arthritis, it's letting them know that there's resources for where they can go to find more about it to help manage it. Great. Thank you. That's excellent. All right. So just to sum it up, arthritis, we want you to stay physically active, um, try to find things that are comfortable, that don't cause pain, but it's really important to stay active. It was great having you. It was super informative. I learned a lot about what you guys do, and that was great. Um, and you taught me some new techniques, this one about the restriction of flow. That's super interesting. And when we're offline, I'm probably going to pick your brain about that a little bit more at some point. Um, and then just in general to everybody watching the video, if you like this video, please subscribe and like the video and thanks for watching. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, Karina.